speaking in my head, the anger in my throat. Our selfish ancestors had made us the protestants. No more. No more. We are no longer silent, no longer ignoring what's happening in front of our very eyes. We will rise up for what's right, because this world was made for all of us. Welcome to A is for Activism, a women in film event that should have taken place on June the 21st at Jupiter Woods in London. But COVID struck again, so we are being creative and we have taken it online. So, Elsa, how did this come about? Hi. Um, well, last February, we were approached by Goldsmith students, art students in their final year, who were in the process of reimagining what a degree show could be. Um, and as part of this kind of reinvention, they asked us to collaborate with them um, to imagine what perhaps we could do with them. Um, the event was to be at Jupiter Woods, an alternative art space, so it was a very different kind of place that we'd, have, we'd ever worked in before. Um, the alternative degree show was a kind of a protest, um, in, in essence, against the commercialization of art, against the entrenched kind of Tory cuts against art education, and it collaborated with kind of Black Lives Matter, all sorts of kind of other groups as well. Um, so it's quite a sort of um, a strong kind of movement. Um, we were very eager to participate, but it kind of forced us in a way to kind of think what we had done and what we might, um, you know, might also what activism means to us. Um, and I think over the years, um, we have collaborated a lot with the community. We've um, invited community groups in to reassess what you know, film and feminism is um, for everyday people. Our community events in libraries, our curating of films have always been in a, in a way kind of small time grassroots activism so in a sense this was very much a great opportunity for us to collaborate with a new generation who were also doing um, not a similar but had the same kind of spirit of activism and it kind of coincided with um, the, the rainbow collective filmmakers who are also going to be collaborating in this um, event and was very much part of what, what we wanted to join up with as well. Thank you very much Elsa. So now we will introduce our guests who are Marion and Katrina, part of the Alternative Degree Show and the Echo Publication, and Hanan from the Rainbow Collective Documentary. Okay, um, we're going to go first to Marianne and I'm just going to ask you the question, why the Alternative degree show why not just go to college get your degree and leave what why did this happen um yeah the eternal question <laughs> um, <laughs> um so for me personally i think it was kind of like born out of a time that i felt incredibly sort of charged with this sort of energy of change um you know this was during the pandemic sort of in the height of it um, last year, and it was kind of superseded by BLM and all, all of these sort of movements that felt incredibly pertinent and necessary, um, which was then obviously followed by one of um, one of the only POC black sort of like academic teachers um, on our course withdrawing their labour quite publicly in response to allegations of racism within the course, um, specifically within the art department at Goldsmiths. And, you know, with our course being so small and kind of dependent on these networks and this, you know, this community that we have, it kind of felt like there was an awakening. Um, well, sort of for me at least, I definitely felt like there was an awakening in terms of like, oh wow, like these are issues that we really, you know, that exists in our own backyard. Um, and I kind of think, luckily, I was around people that felt the same way as I did. You know, they felt like there's no way we can proceed without having done something about the fact that this is going on so closely to us, you know, in such proximity. Um, and I think it was kind of also born out of feeling really hopeless, feeling like us as students don't really have um, the kind of agency that we need to really like enact 
meaningful change in like a really big way. Obviously, like these institutions are massive, much bigger than we are as individuals. Um, you know, especially like in their legal power and whatnot. So we're kind of like, you know, like what sort of thing do we have left that we can leverage? And being in third year, I think we all sort of realized that our time was coming up and it had to be something quite big. And so we had the idea um, to kind of just completely sort of totally reimagine what a degree show is and how it functions and the ways in which it can provide access, the ways in which it can genuinely build community. Um, you know, I think it kind of came out of us thinking about the traditional degree show period as one that's like incredibly toxic in the sense that it sort of, you know, hit students against each other, you know, you kind of have to vie for spaces, you kind of have to vie for resources, and it's, it's always limited, there's like this kind of economy of scarcity, right? Um, and always, of course, uh, students that have more access to such privileges such as money and kind of status and class are obviously poised to do a lot better in their degree show because of access to that resource. Um, and so we were kind of thinking that, you know, us being a small course, maybe it is possible, maybe it's possible to do something meaningful with this kind of like last sort of frontier that we have of a degree show. And um, so we started planting the seeds sort of like, I would say sort of around April of last year. And it, it kind of only really came into fruition like actively around January. And that's when the sort of full scope of things started really happening. We were contacting, you know, um, galleries and community centers and people that were doing interesting things, you know, being sort of active within the Southeast area um, that could maybe help us, that we could collaborate with, that we could bounce ideas off of. And it just wasn't this, you know, it, it kind of turned out to be this really incredibly beautiful sort of endeavor that I think really enriched everyone that participated. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I can't speak on behalf of those that didn't choose to participate, but I definitely understand that it was, yeah, certainly a lot more work than it would have been just, just to just to um, do the traditional degree show with the uni at uni. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it just came down to there were 17 of us who felt some type of way about what happened, you know, even upon reflecting on our own three years that we've been here and thinking about the sort of inequality whether that was overt or covert that we experienced, that our peers experienced, that was, you know, kind of blatantly happening with Gara and the occupation of the death of Tom Hall. That was a massive thing that kind of like, I think really made something happen. But then ultimately, nothing did seem to, to, kind of, to kind of come out of it in terms of meaningful change within the institution. And so it was really like, oh, you know, we really can't expect other people to kind of do this for us it has to really happen from within it has to happen now otherwise you know when is it really going to happen and also we, i think we kind of felt that um evan was sort of quite alone um in their withdrawal of labor and their kind of self-removal from the institution and yeah we just couldn't sort of stand for it really um yeah um i just wanted to ask so i mean with everything that happened in 2020, I kind of don't really need to repeat the whole world knows what happened in 2020. Did some of that weird energy, do you think, carry you to do what you did? Because had we not been the world changed in 2020, do you think that some of that energy was part of it? Or you think you would have anyway? You think you would have anyway? Um. I don't know, that, that's a really good question. I kind of feel like, like it, it, it's easy for me to say that I would have done it regardless, but it, it kind of couldn't have happened without everyone. You know, like it, yeah. it, it, it definitely couldn't have happened with one person sort of being like, you know, let's take the charge and just really steam, steam through. Um, yeah, it, it, it was like entirely this community thing, um, dependent on actually all 17 people that partake. Um, but yeah, I think this, you know, that sort of feeling of overwhelming isolation, that feeling of feeling just really disconnected from others, um, 
was you know, must have been a capitalist in some way or another. It definitely was for me at least capitalist. Um, and I kind of think that we we needed something to band together for, and something. I think it, yeah, it, it, I think it definitely did impact. And also, yeah. um, I just wanted to say, how also was it with um, people not agreeing with what you were doing, whether it was students or the staff? I mean, obviously, no names or anything. But was that quite hard to deal with as well, with making that choice to make that leap and then dealing with, because, um, you know, you, you we all question ourselves, knowing that you, you kind of have that constantly there as well like actually we're not doing this and we're not agreeing with this yeah it was incredibly difficult um yeah i think i definitely at the beginning i was doubting myself like every other week I was like, it's the right thing you know like does it should it sort of change how i feel if people who i respect and are on my course and i see with my peers don't agree with this action um, I'm not quite sure how exactly I rationalized what I did in the end, but it was definitely a really difficult thing to reconcile with. Um, you know, I also imagine maybe this was the same for people that chose not to partake, but they too were sort of questioning whether or not what they were doing was the right thing. Um, but ultimately, I think, yeah, it was kind of about like everyone's personal bandwidth. Um, you know, what they were capable of during the time. It was such a stressful period, you know, from January to June, like writing, what, like four different essays, focusing on your studio practice in a time where things were incredibly uncertain. Like, there was no support here and there, like, um, and, you know, obviously there was pushback from the university in terms of us actually getting this thing done. And if anything, that for me made me want to do it more because I was like, you know, like, why are you trying to silence this really amazing thing that's kind of like um, this hopeful sort of pointing towards the future that we were trying to do as students? Like, it made no sense um, why they weren't supporting it, and in a way that kind of almost bolstered why I was wanting to do it, or mm. maybe even perhaps the kind of need that I felt to do it. Mm. Um, yeah, kind of like made it feel even more urgent, but like actually, yeah, yeah so I think like. When there was pushback from students, it made me question, but when there was pushback from the institution, it just only bolstered that doing this was the right thing, mm. for me, at least. Um, Elsa, do you want any questions? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's incredibly brave what you did, I feel, like, um, especially during the circumstances that, you know, that we were living through. I feel like incredibly courageous to kind of pushed it, and yeah, it's quite moving, really. It's amazing, it's quite emotional. Um, <laughs> I just feel, I mean, did your work suffer at all? Did you, I mean, was that, you know, I don't know, did it impinge upon your, or did it make the work more vital even? Um, and, you know, maybe that's just quite a personal thing, but it must have quite, had quite an impact on you know, the way, you, what you showed maybe? And did your work in a sense become political? Did it become part of the political process of, because it is in a political act what you did in a way, wasn't it? Um, yeah. to withdraw from the whole kind uh, of educational environment in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's just an art question. I don't know. Maybe that's not really to do with kind of what Tracy's been talking about, but it's interesting to know. If... Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we can just be a bit frank about it. Like, it, in all honesty, I do think parts of either the social aspect or the academic aspect or the more practical aspect in terms of my studio practice. Definitely there were things that had to ebb and flow in terms of my energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it was actually like one of the hardest things I've ever done. And yeah. that's, you know, not speaking lightly, like 100% mm. one of the hardest things I've ever done, even mm. in terms of like self-management, time management, people management, liaising with all these big yeah. sort of quite daunting companies um mm. you know being responsible for so many people being responsible for even the kind of representation of this thing that we were doing like how it would be perceived on the other end we didn't know like yeah. what the um yeah like how people would ingest it and take it in um 
<laughs> incredibly stressful. Um, I think surprisingly, I was able to manage sort of making work and putting in all the extra work for the alternative degree show somewhat all right. Um, you know, I was doing like, I'd, I'd go into uni at 10, be in metal and be either in the metal workshop or in the woodworking workshop till seven. And then I'd do like, however many hours of reading and then responding to all these emails and that was from Monday to Sunday for yeah. the past from January to June mm. crazy yeah. like well like an 80 hour week basically <laughs> non-stop um yeah. I think it taught me a lot though like you know I, I can't speak for others but it taught me so much about like the things that motivate me um mm. what, I, what I deem is is good and I think mm. what I do is bad and how I want to work and the people that I want to work with and kind of environments that I want to foster. And yeah. also, I guess it kind of even showed me like what my vision of the art world is to me. Um, mm. Something that I don't actually think university teaches you in any way. I think it's sort of, you know, I, I even question like whether or not art school teaches you what the art world looks like. You know, like there's so many students across both the single honours fine art and the joint honours history of art and fine art that like haven't sent an email to a gallery you know that's like absolutely imperative for being an artist or like at least practicing being an artist um and yeah I think like in doing what we did there was just like so many skills that we taught ourselves and like there was so much professionalism that we had to just like learn immediately and yeah, I think that's like absolutely priceless. Yeah. Um, not sure if it's worth six months of 80 a week an hour, but you know, 80 hour weeks, but you know. Yeah. It's really interesting what you've said because it, it makes me think probably be in about four or five years, there'll be a module about having an alternative degree show and how to go about it and mm -hmm. reflecting on the art world as another module how do you go about um, working in spaces that um, may not be inclusive, that need reflection, or they may be asking you to speak at art institutions of how to actually make them more open. <laughs> so it's really interesting because I think, um, also I hope you've documented your time during those six months, because I think for both, um, all of you, it will be something um, a really important document to have in time. I think at the moment you're just kind of coming out the other side and trying to breathe and clear the fog but I think in a year, two, three years time it will be such a important document to look back on what you've done. It's um, it's absolutely amazing and um, thank you as well for inviting us to um, be part of it and as I said we've kind of put it into this format because of COVID so we're all still being affected by this so um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. What thank gonna... you guys so much as well. No no it's brilliant and we wish you so much success in in your career and wherever you yeah. end up living as well. Um, now we're going to welcome Katrina uh, another ex-Goldsmith student to talk about the publication Echo and how it fits in with um, the theme of our event um, activism. So Katrina, take it away. <laughs> so ECHO started as a Goldsmith Society, um, as a sister society to STAR, which is Student Action for Refugees, um, which is a national organisation. Um, and Julia Chicholella, who's the founder um, and our current editor-in-chief, um, was kind of inspired through the work that she was doing, the volunteering that she was doing, um, to share the stories and experiences of the people that she was meeting, of the people she was volunteering with, people from migrant and refugee and asylum seeking backgrounds. Um, so they started this publication which publishes in three languages, Arabic, English and Farsi. Um, and it's, it's really sort of become a community. Um, I joined in it at coming to the tail end of its second year. Um, now and I joined when it was about six months old um, but to see its sort of growth from there to now and the people we're reaching and the conversations we're having and the campaigns that we're being part of is it, it's quite amazing. What's really interesting is one as a student you've been involved with this um, if you can obviously expand a bit more what attracted you to the mm. work on this magazine but also 
um, the status of refugees is forever in the news. And I think yeah. um, w people must have an opinion on it, whatever, it, whatever side it falls on, left, right, in the centre. Because every day, I mean, currently now we're hearing about um, the Royal National Lifeboats, about not yeah. being allowed to collect them. And it's, you know, all of that. So it is, there's always a story of some sort. So first, can you sort of say what attracted you to want to do this um, project and work on this publication? Yeah, so it was actually by my housemate, um, who was a part of Star and um, Echo um, when we were in second year. And I just sort of started going to events more in solidarity for her, as this was something she was involved with. And then actually, as I got more and more involved and learned a bit more, I became very passionate about it. Um, and that I feel very strongly that circumstance and chance is such a big part of life. Um, and that seeing these people who don't look that different from me, but because, you know, my parents came over, my grandparents came over, as opposed to them coming over now, our lives are so completely different. So if there's anything that I can do for people who, you know, are just my past, essentially, that's like, that means quite a lot to me. Um, and also just some of the people, like the most incredible, courageous, brave, amazing people with these horrific stories. Um, and it really puts everything into perspective when you're sort of complaining about, I don't know, like the torrential rain. <laughs> um, so being it, recognizing that I'm in this position of relative privilege hmm. and that I have not a duty, but if I can share their stories, slightly change views, contribute to the sort of depletion of the hostile environment, then, you know, that's the least I can do. It's quite interesting because um, there seems to be this thread within our discussion within mm -hmm. activism here today about the sort of a, a duty and how you're saying, yeah. you know, you're not in that situation, but it's about chance. And what does it mm -hmm. mean? You know, how do I position myself um, with these stories? And again, any of us here today, it could happen to. It's absolutely yeah. um, just, it is the luck of the draw. Um, and as you said, you know, if you just happen to be walking where a situation is happening, you you and myself could just look like one of these people that mm -hmm. that's happening to. So it's um, really interesting to hear you as a young person taking on that level of responsibility. And do you mm -hmm. think this, um, how you feel about being part of that is also connected to your thoughts with being involved with the Alternative Degree Show? Um, I think so. I think Lewisham, um, particularly as a borough, has a lot and lot of um, people from refugee and migrant backgrounds, specifically, um, particularly from Syria um, and East Africa. Um, so there's sort of the Lewisham Refugee Council, um, there's the uh, Food Bank in Lewisham, um, there's My Grateful UK, which is a sort of cooking based charity that functions out of the borough of Lewisham. Um, so being able to take the art out of Goldsmiths and into the community was kind of a direct link for me because it was taking it into the community of the people who we're trying to raise awareness about or whose voices we're uplifting or whose articles we put in who tell their stories um, or charities we work with. So yeah, it all kind of mm. came together. <laughs> and I think as well, it actually, um, instead of just doing it just in the publication, actually working mm -hmm. with people um, you know, yeah. the, tit the title is refugee, whatever, you know, we, we all can be a mm -hmm. refugee at any point. But working with these people is, uh, I think, the most important thing is moving away from being inside a building and working yeah. with people because then you can actually hear true stories of what mm -hmm. is important rather than what you think might be a good story or yeah. what might look good in the publication. But actually, mm -hmm. you're working and doing the work with people saying actually mm -hmm. this is important and these are the stories that actually we want to get out about ourselves and also um probably things that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think about so also that was happening as part of a is for activism there was an exhibition mm -hmm. can you talk yeah. about the exhibition i know um this is audio um so the week previous to um, a is for activism, the 14th to 20th of June was National Refugee Awareness Week. Um, so at Goldsmiths, um, Echo and Goldsmiths Star in collaboration, we hosted um, a series of events throughout the week. Um, so on the Monday, which was really cool, we had a mini film festival, there was four films, and we invited the directors and the subjects of their films to come and talk and there's a Q&A. Um, 
there was a cooking class with my group, as I mentioned earlier, they cooked a traditional Syrian dish. Um, and then on the Friday, we had a social exhibition, um, which was in collaboration to cre with Create Without Borders, um, which is an organization that kind of, I mean, they have art classes and clubs, but it's about giving people from migrant or Hispanic speaking backgrounds access to art material so they can, you know, sort of heal through creativity. Um, so they came in, they set up some um, paintings, which was beautiful. We had an open call, um, so for photographers and for illustrators, so some people sent their work in. There was work from um, How We Came To Be Project, um, and just some really talented photographers. Um, so four of those photographers, I kindly was allowed to borrow the photos um, to reinstall in Jupiter Woods. Um, and yeah, that was, that was how the exhibition came about. Fantastic. Um, Elsa, is there any questions you would like to ask Katrina? Um, well, as a as an so art graduate now, um, what what? How do you feel that uh, are you going to carry on with this strand, with this kind of you know commitment? Because we're talking about this commitment and this mm -hmm. sort of, almost like a kind of um, yeah, an awareness, an ultra awareness that your generation seems to have, maybe a little bit more than maybe just the one that's just gone. <laughs> Um, so are you going to kind of carry on with this? Are you, do you think this is something that you, you feel is going to be part of your work now? Or yeah, is, I think so. Yeah. I think, well, especially with ECHO, because it's sort of gone beyond uh, university society and it is now just a social enterprise magazine in its own right. Um, I think I'll definitely be involved with that beyond university. Yeah. Um, and what I do for that predominantly is the social media. So creating yeah. infographics and posts and stuff which is a sort of semi-creative way mm -hmm. to do activism um, that isn't creating sort of overtly political art. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that I'm most interested in or something that I'm quite passionate about is art pedagogy and who has access to art, why they have access to art, how they feel about art because of the access or the connotations they have around themselves in the context of art institutions. Um, and I think that having seen the work of Create Without Borders and the submissions we get for the magazine, that there are so many talented artists who didn't go to art yeah. school. Um, so yeah, if, if working with ECHO can help kind of broaden mm. the institutionalization of art or kind of counteract art as an elitist cultural yeah. thing, then yeah, that's mm. what I'm quite passionate about. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. really interesting because the whole art, when you go through art school, is about it being you know out there looking at different things mm -hmm. thinking differently being diverse and however you choose to interpret that word and yet the institutions are quite yeah. narrow which you know everything you're taught um is to be wide open you just be out there do these things um jump on board things have have thoughts have feelings about things but as soon as you start working um it suddenly changes and it's like it, it's almost like building people up for a fall but I think what is really I suppose powerful is that activism through publications through doing the alternative degree show through all um, contacting galleries and all the work that was involved that you probably never expected to do that is um, a big part of your education but as well as changing how things can work because I think after the year we've had, or 2020, how things are changing, I think that momentum has to continue because I think that is a big way to make things change and actually open up these spaces that should be opened, who are now saying things like, you know, we welcome people from all different communities. Well, actually, it should have been that anyway. Um, yeah. And should have, it should be at your forefront of your mind. You know, if you have a building, you know, you, you automatically think, is there, is there a lift? Is there a disabled access toilet? You know, you, you, you don't instantly build a building that's going to be so inaccessible to people. You know, it, it's that way of thinking, um, which I think is amazing that this is kind of a, a constant that's kind of come out through these conversations. Sorry, today. Elsa, was there anything else? No, I was just going to say, this is that example of Tracy and I were in, <clears throat> in a quite famous gallery yesterday. I don't know if I can say which one it was. No, you don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very kind of pristine place, very in the middle of... London. Just say London. <laughs> Tracy made the comment that 
it was this huge vast space with pretty much nothing in it like beautiful space mm. that you could just you know massive <gasps> Acres of, and then you know where's well this is in the middle of london where there are some kind of very deprived kind of like yeah. states and where's the corner for like the community where is the community yeah i mean uh, there, there was space in there yeah. that was actually it was it was, shocking. It it was, was shocking, shocking that it was there was nothing then i just thought there could be a space you have got schools around here you have got people around here yeah. i am sure there is somebody in some of these um uh, accommodations that are around here that aren't you know wealthy who have dreams and aspirations to do something different and if you offer it somebody might just go oh why not out of the 500 people there might be two that think actually I'd like to give it a go but there's space there and you can make space if you want it's like giving up power you can give it up to actually also empower yourself as a person because also through this conversation today, which is um, really lovely to hear, is how people feel, how their actions make them feel. And I think with the space that we were in, I, it, it would have made the experience much more interesting for me. The exhibition was fine, you know, but it was spoke same. about it, but there was yeah. something lacking yeah. And um, something that we both really enjoyed about the space was um, mm -hmm. outside the building, there was a mum blowing bubbles and her children were running up and down. And we thought, actually, that's almost right. like looking at a film, but the other way, <laughs> outside of the museum. To connect the world, to connect the, the art yeah. with the real world, with the, the world mm -hmm. out there. The yeah. The world. yeah, because it is just a space and we are all living in this space, which um, seems like the constant wanting to block things off which yeah but as i said it's been challenged constantly um katrina is there anything else you want to add um no i don't think so okay well oh, go to oh. um echo uh zine .com. <laughs> okay do you want to say that yeah. one more time echo <laughs> um echo zine online .com, no spaces and there's all the back publications there <laughs> fantastic well done for remembering <laughs> well thank you so much for being part of A's for activism and inviting us uh, women in film SE15 to be part of it and even though this um, format is different to what we wanted I'm just so glad that we again the main thing is hearing voices and having the space and it's another sort of documentation of your journey um, which I'm sure will be very exciting so thank you both thank you so much guys um, we are now going to welcome Hanan from the Rainbow Collective and what we'll do is let Hanan talk about the Rainbow Collective documentary and their work in activism. So Hanan, over to you. Okay, hi there. Yeah, so my name is Hanan Majid from the Rainbow Collective. Uh, Rainbow Collective is a documentary production company uh, as well as making broadcast and independent documentaries. We, met, we specialize in doing campaign films for organizations, everything, you know, we uh, cornered ourselves as the official filmmakers from everything from the McStrike campaign, uh, which is a campaign to get McDonald's workers unionized, uh, freetibet.org, uh, the International Tibet Net Network. Uh, we work with the BLM movement. We work with Palestine Solidarity Campaign to do all of their videos, campaign against the arms trade. War on One, uh, as well as quite a few other uh, groups that we've been working with uh, over, over the years uh, to do everything from 90 second campaign videos to I just did one now, which was like a 16 minute short documentary about the Arab Spring, which was for a uh, campaign against the arms trade. And, but as well as doing that, another arm of our business, uh, of what we do is we work with young people to do uh, training projects around filmmaking and animation and uh you know the young people that we work with can range from anything from six seven years old to uh people in their 20s you know we do we even do uh once a year pre-pandemic we were doing uh, uh uh sessions for the rca uh so yeah we have a huge range we work with uh the type of young people that we work with and the reason we do that is because uh, a lot of the youth groups that we work with are from diverse communities like where I am now, which is uh, South London, Peckham. And as someone 
uh, who's been in the industry for so long now, like uh, over 15 years. One of the things that uh, anyone who's in this industry cannot deny is that the industry is not diverse in any way. It's not diverse when it comes to people of color. It's not diverse when it comes to uh, gender. And so what, one of the things that we started doing with our workshops was we started working with young people who were from communities like this. So young people who are of color, uh, we've trained probably a lot more young women than we have done boys and men. And that's to kind of address the balance that's there. And one of the things that we've always thought is that you can't, you know, when things like the uh, Oscar So Why happen or the Me Too movement happen or things, you know, the industry might think that they can just open the door and everyone's going to come flooding in. And one of the things that we thought was actually, the communities, the communities that we're talking about, they need to know that the industry is there for them, especially the British film industry. So in order to do that, let's work with young people so that we're training them so that they can aspire to go into a career of filmmaking. And so over the years, we've had dozens and dozens of students who have gone into the industry, working in England. Quite a few have actually gone abroad now and have become directors and places like Vietnam, or they've gone travel to Spain, France, places like this, and they're doing their careers there. But yeah, this is one of the things, one of the reasons why we have this two parts of our business, the campaigning, which is what we do, and then the other element, which is we pass on our, our, uh, the, what we've learned. And we don't just do that here in England, we do a lot of workshops. We've done it over the past in places like Bangladesh, working with street children, children of garment and domestic workers. We run a film school in uh, downtown Kingston. We've done this in Turkey, where we worked with children in Istanbul. Uh, we've done it in Cambodia, working with children of garment workers over there as well. And again, it's the same wherever you go, whether it's, whether it's uh, diversity or whether it's class structures or whether it's gender. You know, if you're talking about the industry, say, whether it was, if it was in uh, Turkey, for example, it's probably to do with gender and class structure. It's probably to do with gender and class structure. And it's the, and it's the same if you're, uh, when we were in Cambodia, you know, when we were working with children of garment workers, well, they're going to have really fascinating and interesting stories. And, this, and the same with children of garment workers and street children in Bangladesh, you know, because this is a huge, Garments industry is like a massive industry over there. It's the biggest industry there is, but it's, it's an industry built on exploitation. And it's not just the women that are exploited, it's their children who are exploited as well. And so that's one of the reasons why we started doing multiple workshops and projects with young uh, children, uh, uh, young people over there to get them to talk about uh, how they feel about their, their, uh, the work that their parents do. Can I just ask um, Hanan, it's really interesting because going from what um, Marianne uh, spoke about um, with, you know, making this decision to do this kind of active gesture of activism. Did you know that you were going to do um, work in activism for a lot of your career? So, so uh, I'm just trying to think. So the first documentary we made was in South Africa and it was a feature length documentary about children at a high school there. So it was post-apartheid and we were showing this one school in the township, which, which was just massively excelling, despite the fact that it was an all black school, despite the fact that it was underfunded, and despite the fact that it was, one of, it was in a township and every other school was failing. And this school was getting better grades than your all white schools. And so that experience of being there taught us a lot about what we want to do, me and Richard, who I run the uh, uh, production company with, they taught us a lot about what we want to do with ourselves as filmmakers and what our role is, uh, and not just in the industry, on this planet, you know, uh, what we're going to do with film. And so when we were over there, we, you know, we knew that film has, and I've always, you know, me and Richard went to film school together, but I also spent five years working at the Photography and Film Museum in Yorkshire. So I spent a, lo a lot of my film school time was also working in a cinema, watching art house films, watching documentaries from all around the world. And 
one thing that I always had was I knew the role, the role of film and the role of documentary and the power that it has. And when we, were, when we had the camera in our hands and we had that power, we, it was a case of what do, you, what do you do with it? And, you know, and I think that experience of South Africa being in the township, spending all the time with those families and seeing all sorts of things really, it really opened our eyes as to, well, what do we want to do? Richard used to make films before and he stopped making films and we were, we were like, we will just concentrate on documentaries about social justice, about children's rights and the skills that we've got, we will use them to highlight these types of issues. So when we did, we finished doing the documentary in the school, the following year we went and did a documentary about street children in Cape Town. And then from then onwards, we just, that is what we, that's how we kind of run our career and kind of amped it up every year. We just amp it up with the type of campaigns we do and who we get involved with. And yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, kind of going back a bit, um, what I spoke to with Marianne about is how, when you found yourself doing more and more kind of work to do with uh, documentaries to do with activism and making change, um, how did people respond to you from your either your peers or other people who probably didn't may have gone yeah. a different route? How, how was that? Because that again, it affects you know the people at the alternative degree show at the beginning of their career and you you know 15 years on from doing that will be quite interesting to see how you dealt with that yeah I think the thing was when I so when I was at film school I just remembered you know so my final year I specialized in documentaries from my year two in film school onwards I, I just I, I think halfway through I thought documentaries is what I want to do so in year three we made a documentary like a 45 minute documentary about asylum seekers and it was in response to, this was in 2004, I think it was. There was a, just a lot of negative stuff about asylum seekers and refugees. You open any paper and they were just like bombarded with things. And so we, stopped, we thought, me and who I was working with thought, we want to talk about this. We want to highlight this. We want to put refugees and asylum seekers in front of the camera to share their stories and how they've come into, you know, how they've ended up coming into Britain. And so, I mean, that gave me a bit of, so even around then, the, the, my fellow students that I was working with kind of weren't doing things like that. You know, I followed that with doing a personal documentary about young people in Leeds who were homeless, like a creative documentary, which was shot on Super 8. Uh, the sound was done on a mini disc. I used uh, an, a, a, a 35 mil SLR camera. And uh, yeah, it was quite creative, but it was about something. And I think around then and then spending time with Richard and we were we would spend hours just talking about film and the role of film and documentary and what you can do and it, it was just a case and it's what we always say to our students if you're going to make something make it about something because that's what you can do there are people making some brilliant make-believe films and I love watching them but the people who are interested in uh my supervision or the people who are interested in me making something, a Rainbow Collective making anything, they know that, you know, we want to make something about an issue and highlight something and try to create some sort of change. You know, that's our tagline, you know, using film and documentary to create social change. And What's, I know- um, can, Oh, sorry, I was, sorry. I was just going to say, I know f uh, documentary can do that, film can do that, mm. you know? Uh, even films, they can be about, uh, uh, an issue, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, the power of film, whether it's fiction or documentary, but what's really interesting that sort of ties in with um, the, I should now say, ex-Goldsmith students mm. and the de alternate, uh, alternative degree show is when you also say about what it means to you as a person, where it, it the same way how um, making the choice to do the alternative degree show was how, you know, if I don't do this, can I live with myself? Um, will I regret it? And it's really interesting that you, you say about how you work and what's important to you, which I sometimes think get missed when people talk about um, their work, whether whether it's painting, film, um, whatever whatever medium it is within the art world. So that's uh, I think that's a really interesting um, aspect, actually, to come out of um, the conversations between both of you at different points in mm. your career. Um, Elsa, is there anything that you'd like to ask Hanan? 
I mean, no, I was just thinking about that idea of having that responsibility. Like, I think that's what's going through from kind of the Goldsmith students and Hanan's um, kind of take on what they produce. It's like that responsibility to, to what they do. Like with you, Hanan, like obviously at, art, at film school, you had a choice. Could you go down this route or that route? Or I guess I, I've not been to film school, but, mm. but then that kind of, I don't know, you know, what films you were watching or what, clicked or it was probably seeing like you know going you know, seeing certain films but that, that idea that wow that, you know i've got this thing i've got this ability this power to kind of to re to represent the world in what way like that that must be that's quite a powerful thing and um yeah i, I just feel that's kind of kind of um that's what's amazing about documentary film is yeah and i don't know and I, I, I kind of see it in, and you have watched a lot of documentaries and there's some documentaries where it comes through very strongly and others that don't like, a, um, yeah, so. And I, I just wondered whether it's something, I mean, would, would you ever go down the other route, the, the narrative route? Um, I mean, oh, I'm, we have thought about it over the years. And I think if we ever did it, I think it would be one of those where it would probably be shot like a documentary, you know? Yeah. I don't know, it'd yeah. be shot very much in a Paul Greengrass mm -hmm. style yes. where it would just be like, you know, handheld and it would just follow people around. Probably yeah. be, maybe not the script, but the way that you mm -hmm. film it would be very, uh, it would just be quite free flowing mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense that you would probably wouldn't, you probably wouldn't uh, do a storyboard or anything like that. You'd probably just yeah. want to, yeah. You and know, I think there's potential in infusing yeah. the two, yeah. Because that's what I love about documentary is that we go into documentary shoots, especially when it's when it's ones that are observational and we have no plan. Yeah. Like I've, I've done like Al Jazeera documentaries where I've given them a fake kind of script and I'm not and I know I'm not going to stick to that script It's just for their purposes. And yeah. we will go in. And I won't think I won't. I will know the subject matter, but I won't have a felt thought about how it's going to be filmed. We just mm. go in there and you want them to kind of dictate who you're yeah. filming with who you're filming with them will in a way what they do dictates what you're going to do. So you always just have to be on, you know? And I yeah. think, I think that's quite exciting, you know, Definitely. when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're making. When yeah. You're making so in a sense, they, they come on the narrative in a way. Yeah. It's not you. Yeah, yeah. Which is, yeah. And I, and I think we're living in a really, a real, there's always, it's been in my career, I found so many golden ages of documentary, but we really are at the moment because of things mm -hmm. like Netflix and Amazon prime yeah. and, in America, HBO and all of these, That's so cool. many people are interested in documentaries, you know, and the budgets are generally pretty good nowadays. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people, people don't have to go, whereas when I was doing it stuff, you'd have to go to the cinema to watch a Michael Moore documentary, for example, you know, mm -hmm. it was just the big names that were getting their documentaries in the cinemas. Sure. Whereas now you've got Netflix and it's brilliant. You get so many things on there, Netflix or mm. Amazon Prime or any of the other streaming services. I don't know if anybody just watched, I just finished watching the new Crossfire documentary by Steve McQueen. Absolute breathtaking, absolute breathtaking. Here's a Oscar winning director coming into our industry and making a documentary because he knows the power of it because yeah. how else do you tell that story? You know, those people deserve justice. Well, let's, mm. Let's talk to those actual people rather than. Yeah. So I think, you know, where it's, it's a really good, and it's not just that, just the final thing for campaign films, we're really in it, we're in a golden age as well. You know, yeah. people are really want to watch campaign films. They want bite sized information. They want something in two minutes, two minutes 20, which is your Twitter length. They want to know that. We know we did, I think the film we were going to show was the Black Lives Matter video that our young people did. That was a huge hit. You know, it was it was about the Black Lives Matter movement that was happening. Our young people wanted to have solidarity with the George Floyd and the protesters. And they created a, 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 some artwork and we created a film around it, seven minute film. And we had everything from psychologists, doctors, teachers, people from all over the sec so many sectors in, in, in America and Britain contacted us saying, well, I'm going to be using that, 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 that film. Uh, that documentary uh, in our education system. I'm going to be sharing it with students. I'm going to be sharing it with doctors. That's the power. I think um, what's really interesting, actually, which is kind of a good segue to talk about, like with the 
what activism means to people, but also what children see and how they respond. Because I think in the Black Lives Matters films that the children made, it, it was what they were reacting to and what they were seeing, what they were hearing and trying to make sense of this world and what has happened. And there is a bit in it where one of the children say, I th something, um, I'm paraphrasing, something along the lines of, I didn't sort of think this was still happening which yeah, is yeah. really interesting mm. um so in a way that activism it, it's it's not just one thing mm. it's also how people respond to things because as you said now that this video that the children made as a response is being used um by lots of different people in different ways so it's really interesting how um yeah activism isn't just being on the street protesting no. it comes in so many different formats and obviously mm. creatively that's kind of arenas taken care of but just from within the community it's quite important that you know if you do need to make change or something you kind of have to put your head above the pulpit but it doesn't necessarily mean in a way that you may feel uncomfortable with but it might be in a way that you can do it in a way that you do feel comfortable with because you you know you have to live with your choice that you make so I it's, I, yeah I was just gonna say that I think now like so whenever things are happening with the Black Lives Matter protests or you know, I couldn't go to them. Richard, my colleague, went to, went, to, went to them. But we thought, actually, what's more useful for us is not to be at them always, is to produce things for them. And so we, that's what our role was. And it's the same with the Palestine Solidarity uh, Movement, you know. When we saw stuff was happening uh, uh, recently when uh, 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 at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, when people were getting, you know, uh, uh, you know tear gas and things, we were like, let's just quickly make something together from people's mobile phone footage. And that's going to be much more important than any me turning up as one person, you know, amongst hundreds of other people at a protest. You know, that's our, that, that can be our role. Art has a huge role to play in activism. I think it's a massive role to play in activism. That's, um, yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's really interesting to hear, especially with your career. And um, as I said, how it ties in so much, I think, with... Um, a lot what the Goldsmith students have been talking about. So um, if there's anything else, Elsa, that you want to ask, I was just... No, no, I'm just going to talk about the, the mobile phone and the ability of like people on the spot to be able to kind of then, you know, contribute, like, you know. It's, it's, uh, yeah, the digital age has allowed us to be even more creative, I think. It's, it's a huge thing. We do most of our workshops now are with people uh, doing citizen journalism courses where we teach them how to use their mobile phone as a tool to create videos and campaign films and, mm -hmm. and also to create art films and stuff like this to create yeah. poetic films. The going, having this, which has got like a 4K camera on it, has changed everything. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we've gone from a time when you had to have a 4,000, two, 3,000 pound yeah. camera exactly. to create something to having, uh, you know, something just on your phone. Yeah. Anyway, I think I've talked quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, Hanan. And um, yeah, continue doing your amazing, amazing work. The tightness in my belly, the confusion in my head, the anger in my throat. Our suffered ancestors had made us the protesters. No more. No more. We are no longer silent, no longer ignoring what's happening in front of our very eyes. We will rise up for what's right, because this world was made for all of us.